thought it would be really nice to have a Rolls Royce sat in front of the property as these uh, agents arrive and it would just set set the tone. And they agreed and uh, a little bit of toing and froing, they, they said that I could pick it up. Um, my manager at the time said I absolutely could not pick up a Rolls Royce. Welcome to People Who Perform, the Real Estate Careers Podcast. Each episode will bring you conversations from business leaders and up and coming stars in the commercial real estate industry in Canada. Our guests will share their unique career journeys, passions, and advice on what it takes to be successful in this industry. This podcast is brought to you by Highview Partners, connecting people who perform in Canadian real estate. I'm your host, Richard Costello, and today I'm pleased to introduce Jack Haining. Jack is based in Vancouver and is an investment manager with Grosvenor Americas, responsible for overseeing portfolio analytics and directly managing the portfolio of commercial assets. Originally from the UK, Jack has worked for Grosvenor since graduating from the University of Reading's real estate program in 2014. In 2018, he was offered the opportunity to relocate to Vancouver and naturally, being Jack, he said yes. In our conversation, we'll learn more about Jack's career, what's involved in his role as an investment manager at Grosvenor, how working in London compares to Vancouver, and how Jack has embraced all that beautiful BC has to offer. Jack, welcome to the Real Estate Careers Podcast. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, for that stellar introduction. It's uh, an honor to be on the, uh, the, the podcast today. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome, Jack. Well, first off, for anyone listening who is unfamiliar, what can you tell us about Grosvenor? Most people probably know it, it, it's a, an international property company with this rather lengthy uh, sort of 340 plus year track record. It develops stuff, it manages buildings, um, it operates now in sort of 59 uh, cities around around the world. Um, and its focus today is on promoting sustainability within the built environment, but enough of that sort of the, the, the corporate spill there, but I would like to just touch on some of the history because I think that uh, particularly here in Canada, it's uh, something that sets Grover apart and just from a, a, a personal perspective is is really quite interesting. Go from, you know, how it started, uh, how many years ago and, and today you know, invests in food and ag tech, um, it, it does rural estate management, um, it has uh, various cha- charitable initiatives as well alongside the, the property business. But it, it actually, um, you know, the ancestry of Grosvenor can be traced back sort of a thousand years. Um, it's a bit of a history lesson, but um, the days of sort of William the Conqueror, for 600 years, the first 600, they were investing in uh, amassing wealth through sort of land holdings, but also in investing in coal and stone and lead mines Uh, and there was actually a marriage back in 1677 you you probably remember it it actually don't you Richard (laughs) between Sir Thomas Grosvenor and a lady called Mary Davies and it it, what it did it it, uh, joined two big land holdings together Um, and at the time they were meadows and marshland and pastures to the west of London and London had been through the great fire the, the, the plague, and people wanted to move away from the crowds, uh, the disease, and and West London then um, was was developed, and this marshland was developed into what we now know as Mayfair and Belgravia. Wow. Anyway, uh, yeah, today uh, I'm part of the North American uh, property business um, that has been sort of actively investing in and. Uh, developing in the US and Canada for uh, just over 70 years. It started out close to where we're both based uh, in in Vancouver or just outside uh, with the acquisition of Anasis Island down in Delta in 1952. And it it was opened in 1955 as Canada's uh, first industrial park. And put very simply, the, the, the family... Uh, The Grosvenor family was super exposed to London and real estate. And by moving out to Canada, it was a a sort of familiar market that they were there able to move into and expand globally and and diversify. 
so they, they, they didn't have all of their uh, investments in, in one sector in one place as it were and today um, the focus is on sort of expanding and acquiring uh, value-add residential and commercial assets the portfolios um, just short of five billion dollars the, the teams refurbished sort of 4,000 homes and delivered lots of new homes. And, uh, you know, in North America, it, it's split into three sort of core businesses. There's the uh, investment team, which is where I, where I work and sit. The development team, I'm sure people have perhaps seen some of the buildings around the lower mainland that they, they, they've completed in Ambleside or uh, the Pacific. Um, and then also the structured development finance bit. Uh, which effectively is a, an equity lending business to resi developers around North America. So uh, hopefully that was a bit of a, a summary. Really interesting. Thanks, Jack. Could you describe what your path has looked like to get you to this point? So I took what uh, was a partly traditional um, and then definitely a, a partly non-traditional route to, to get me here. I, I first of all did a bit of work experience. It was a, an evaluation company in London called uh, Lambert Smith Hampton. And that got me interested in sort of real estate and whatnot. And then I, I opted for the real estate course at, at Reading. Um, it seemed like a vocational route um, that offered very career options that you could go into development or investment or, or, or the real estate finance side. And quite quickly, I, uh, whilst I was at uni, I figured I'd wanted to be sure that that was the, the, the right sector for me. And I was really keen to, to see what other sectors were like and what, what they would, would have to offer. So where, where some people were sunning themselves on, on the beaches in, in, in Spain, I applied for a whole host of internships um, and, and, and ended up sort of filling my summers. So I found myself in Melton Mowbray in a, a fish food factory briefly with uh, with Mars and then um, also was interested in corporate law for a while and and, and did some time at Clifford Chance and I, I then had my internship at Grosvenor it was a, a two-week um, internship in London and there they uh, set me a, a project um, that related to one of their developments now this was uh, where they, they had a listed, an old listed building that was actually being used as a, a car park at the time. And it was being transformed into this uh, rather lovely Beaumont Hotel, a five-star hotel um, with a, an Anthony Gormley art piece called Room on, on the front. Just the, the transformation um, from car park to five-star hotel uh, and the amenity and life that that brought to this slightly back street of Mayfair, I just thought was fascinating and, 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 you know, decided, right, this is the point I want to commit. And so off the back of that um, internship, I got um, offered a, a graduate position. And in the UK, uh, you, you work towards a chartered surveyor qualification. So it gave me the chance to work in finance and strategy and um, financial analysis and, and, and some asset asset management and as part of that about a year in there was a role came up in in Grosvenor fund management that today is called Grosvenor Europe and I ended up relocating to the to the uh, Milan office and I'd been interviewed by the director of Italy um, a wonderful chap Pietro Clemente um, I didn't say that with a very good Italian accent I know um, he'd be horrified and uh, ro rocked up on day one to find that the Milan Italy team consisted of myself and Pietro Clemente. So it was a very, very small team and a very, very different role underwriting retail assets um, with many, many rather amusing stories as I, I, I bumbled my way through life, unable to speak Italian in, in, uh, in Milan. Um, and then came back to London um, for a while doing asset management and leasing on their, their London estate before going for the opportunity to be the portfolio analyst for the North American investment portfolio and uh, moved out here um, at the start of 2019. Haven't looked back. Yeah, that's fantastic. Sounds very, very glamorous, Jack. Well, it'd be great to hear more about your current role then. So what are the main responsibilities as an investment manager at Grosvenor? 
I think that's a really interesting question because you know, investment manager in your current role, you know, can mean different things at different companies. I've got a, a sort of split uh, role. So I have um, responsibility for managing a portfolio of industrial retail uh, and an office property. Um, and then also oversee the portfolio analytics. So day to day, that's that's kind of reporting on uh, the portfolio's health, whether that be looking at the budgeted income, the bad debt, the uh, occupancy of the portfolio, um, and then overseeing things like the valuations um, going up or maybe down, and, then, and the wholesale analysis where we'll look at each asset across the portfolio against the metrics and decide what we want to do with it in the next sort of 12 to 18 months. Um, and then that just feeds all into our strategic plan, really, um, that we work on with the finance team. So fairly broad role, moved over into it in September. So still finding my feet, but enjoying it. So you, you moved into this new role as of September last year? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah fantastic. And so yeah, fairly broad role. What do you, what do you enjoy most about, about it? For me, it would have to be the variety. Uh, coming from London, I was uh, in my most recent sort of role, it was a kind of leasing and asset manager role. In this role, it, it's that broad portfolio perspective that I particularly appreciate. Um, and it allows me to work and collaborate with teams all over the, the, the business. So there's an office in DC in San Fran, and you know, one day it will uh, be working closely with the financial reporting team or the research team. Um, and then I also get to sort of use some of those asset management skills now um, that I got in London and apply them to the assets over here in Canada. Jack, what would you say are some of the trends that you've observed that are changing the way that, that you do your job? I'll say that there's, there's a few things that stand out um, that I've, I've really noticed. So one of them uh, I touched on is that um, that big push to reduce the environmental impact of our portfolio. I know that we were all being bombarded in the property press or in, in market research reports or in panels we sit on um, hearing net zero, but it, it really is um, more than a lip service. And you know, Gro Grosvenor was one of the first sort of signatories to this World Green Building Council zero carbon commitment um, back in 2019. And Obviously, that's now you know a commitment. So, us, like other many other groups now, are having to to go through the portfolio um, and develop a bit of a new skill set and, and toolkit to try and work out what capital projects we can do to in, enhance the energy efficiency and reduce environmental impact of buildings. And obviously, there's often a big cost to that, and you're balancing meeting commitments with feasibility um studies and whatnot and you know an example of uh some of the sort of things would have been a really easy decision for um the investment managers that a couple of them based in um in california um there's two buildings there two big office buildings and due to the uh rather different climate they're they're currently sticking sort of solar panels across the rooftops of the parkade and the, the offices and they actually have really short payback times of sort of six years. I, I sadly uh, don't think with the, the, the grey clouds set behind me today, we'd, we'd have the same uh, payback in Vancouver. But um, that's, that, that's been a real shift and a real focus. Yeah. And, and, and secondly, it would be, and it, in some ways it was accelerated by uh, COVID. Um, I think COVID obviously has had various, uh, it's led to various structural changes and things, but one of them was people's desire for information and access to data and live tracking. And as real estate was sort of pretty severely impacted, uh, particularly certain sectors, um, decision made makers just wanted to know exactly what was going, going on so they could make quick sort of informed decisions. And for us, it's really pushed us towards adopting a lot of new sort of software and technology. So we're now using Power BI a lot. Um, you know, we rely on Argus a, a great deal and we're, we're automating lots of processes, working on a sort of dashboard that, that 
hopefully it's going to save me lots of time and uh, allow me to focus on other things. But that, that's been a trend. And to the extent that um, this year, sorry, last year, we hired from UBC um, a candidate from the data analytics master's program um, that brought a sort of different skill set to the business. And uh, we've found uh, uh, Kathy, who I now, now work with every day, ex- an extremely valuable addition for that, those reasons. Yeah, no, thanks, Jack. With respect to the market, what are the main challenges you're up against at this time in order to, yeah, to, to perform your role as an investment manager? It, it's an interesting time, I'm sure, for many people. I, I mentioned earlier that we've got quite an ambitious sort of growth target for the investment portfolio. So we've hired a new a senior hire in, in DC who's focusing solely on capital raising. And we've got lots of existing partners uh, from pension funds to very wealthy families. But we're now wanting to bring on new partners and then acquire lots of sort of uh, residential um, and commercial sort of assets in, in the key markets. But the, the acquisitions environment is definitely challenging at the moment. It's highly competitive. There's a great deal of capital that is sat ready to be deployed. And what we're seeing is that the opportunities that are presenting themselves, there's uh, significantly more interest uh, in them. Um, and also, you know, therefore, that the, we're having to sort of accept greater levels, heightened levels of risk and you know, lower returns um, for that, that risk in order to be competitive on pricing. And, and often these assets will require sort of more heavy lifting from asset management uh, point of view, which is actually, you know, quite interesting and fulfilling for members of the team. But it's 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 tough out there to 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 get to, to buy things. Um, and a lot of people are chasing desirable properties. Probably one of the, the second challenges, um, you know, a lot of people are talking about the future of offices and the future of cities and this is obviously a risk to Grosvenor because it has committed to being present in core cities across North America. And with with COVID, people obviously have um, sort of stopped going to cities and working remotely. And I don't see it as a, a threat to offices going forward because ultimately, on a more flexible basis, people are coming back to offices and, and there are many, many of benefits to being physically present in the office from collaboration through to the sort of buzz and, and whatnot. We all know that those benefits. Um, but actually, it's the downtime because people won't probably be returning to the five days a week. And when people aren't in our cities, you know, the surrounding kind of amenities and retail um, services like the coffee shops and the sandwich bars will be hit and I think that that is something that is going to really affect um, those sort of occupiers um, and, and one of the things we track is uh, footfall which is a really cool metric and um, we buy the data and it, it, it tracks people's phone usage don't worry it's totally anonymized although I know exactly <laughs> where you've been at, uh, at all times of the day Richard um, <laughs> And what we saw is that footfall in Vancouver absolutely fell off a cliff um, in early 2020 at the start of COVID, then fell again, it never actually recovered. It then fell again with uh, the arrival of uh, wonderful Omicron and it, it, it just hasn't recovered. So people aren't coming back to the cities and obviously cities rely on people to support all of the amenities that make cities great. So we, we're quite you know, hopeful that with people returning to the office, the footfall will pick back up, but it's been really stuck low now for uh, just over a couple of years. Probably the final challenge that, again, a bit of a, a hot ticket item people are talking about is in inflation. And um, it's fair to say, obviously, inflation is very high. We're noticing it when we go to the grocery stores and buy our bananas and, and what whatever ever else um for you it's probably sort of organic sockeye locally reared salmon or something i don't know but obviously you know, 
this is through the uh, expertise largely of uh, Brian Biggs, who oversees the research based in San Fran. Uh, and, and I very much rely on his wisdom, but he very much points to the, the, the fact that actually inflation has been below target for almost a decade now. And yes, it's um, in the short term, it, it, it is obviously now uh, increased significantly, but there are clear reasons why that is. And it's um, largely driven by the, the supply chain issues. And the, the major concern would be if people's consumer confidence decreases and people stop spending money uh, in response to inflation and start saving their money and momentum sort of falls away from the economy. But anyway, he, he doesn't seem too concerned at the moment because it is a very short term change. And the, the biggest risk to, re to the real estate industry would be the response of the central banks to inflation. So if, if they start increasing interest rates too drastically, obviously the cost of debt will go up and therefore people's ability to buy real estate at high prices goes down as, as their, their costs increase. But I'm not the expert, Brian Biggs is. Well, in, in Brian, we trust then. He's Absolutely. Great safe hands, Jack. <laughs> no, that, that's fantastic, Jack. And I guess a bit of a summary then, the, the, the main challenge is being just, it's difficult to buy something. It's very competitive and there's a, there's a lot of money waiting to, to be deployed. You, you, you've got a pin in, in you're watching the return to cities and people returning to the offices and how that kind of impacts your core business model of, of making these downtown cores really great places to be. Um, and then, yeah, interest rates kind of one, one, one to watch. Well, Absolutely. Jack, what, what about advice that you might have for somebody starting out in their career and wants to move towards investments or asset management? Are there any specific skills like programs or courses that, that you'd recommend? I would say the advice would be get as much broad experience as you can and wherever possible, do try and upskill on things and, and do things that other people perhaps aren't necessarily doing. So come saying that you've actually done a basic course online on, on Power BI and that you can present data, you know, graphically and differently. Um, if you can, can do some basic Argus trading, um, groups now, most large groups rely on Argus for their um, track, their portfolio and, and include all the, the information for each property. And then also um, when underwriting, properties will be using Argus often as well. So that, that, that's a great tool to be able to reference and say that you have some familiarity uh, uh, with. Um, and, and it does have many quirks and it's something that when you join a firm, you'll want to just throw yourself into and test it out and uh, try not to ruin their uh, portfolio in it. But, um, you know, I, there are lots of great online courses. I actually um, did one not so long ago. You do have to pay, pay a little for it, but it's um, the ACRE Real Estate Accelerator. Um, but, but, you know, despite all of this, I would really drum home the message that real estate is still a relationships business and it's great to upskill with some of the data stuff and some of this new software but thankfully uh, relationships are still still king. Are you looking for a recruitment partner that understands your unique hiring needs and can truly represent your business to the market? When you work with Highview Partners it will feel like an extension of your company our process is proven to help you find exceptional talent, which we accomplish by understanding your company's values and culture first. We then commit to a strategic plan, navigate any challenges, and find the candidate who fits the role and your company best. Together, we will help you build a winning team. To discover more about our services, contact us today or visit us at highviewpartners.ca. So Grosvenor's well known for their portfolio of properties in London. Like, how did your role differ working in Europe? And I, I'm wondering what stories might you have that, that you can share with us to give us an insight of, of what, what, you, what your role and, and work was like, was like there? Yeah, absolutely. So, so as you uh, rightly say, Grosvenor in London and in the UK is a very different uh, beast to uh, Grosvenor in North America. Um, you know, for starters, the London portfolio in Mayfair and Belgravia is 
It's an extremely unique area, extremely wealthy, and, and is also extremely historic. So it, it includes you know, four or five hundred in independent retailers in historic properties that requires a different approach to asset management. And, you know, I would like to mention a few of the sorts of uh, tenants and uh, people that you would have to work with in London, because it's quite different to the large scale, more institutional assets that Grosvenor owns in North America, where the tenants, you know, my tenants include groups like Pepsi. And um, in, in London, you know, you'd be down on in Belgrave here on Elizabeth Street, you're dealing with Philip Tracy, who makes hats for the Queen, and uh, through to Pe- Peggy Portion, you know, the most Instagrammable cupcakes in the world come out of uh, Peggy Portion's pink, pink doors every morning. Um, and then you put in thing, throw into the mix things like uh, a New York baker, uh, Dominic Ansel went it on, on and really created a bit of a stir with his launch of, of, of the Cronut. And, all these things just add you know, quite a lot of, of interest from an asset management point of view. And you'll end up in, in some quite unique situations. You know, on Buckingham Palace Road near Victoria Station in uh, Westminster, the, the, the Seychelles have their embassy and uh, we, we own the building. And so I was sent down to agree a, a lease renewal. And being a small country and a small embassy, um, it ended up being done... Uh, in the back of a, a sort of BMW 7 Series with the uh, Seychelles ambassador, who was just a phenomenally awesome and interesting lady. Things that are really quite unique <laughs> just add so much colour to, uh, to to day-to-day life. There, there, there was one more story that I think, uh, it, you know, it would be worth uh, telling, and I think you'll, you'll find amusing. Um, the... Uh, the team in, in London had a, a, a tower that they'd built, a series of towers called Neo Bank Site. This was a really high-end development um, that was done in partnership. And they had a, the penthouse, which to this day is my dream apartment, the absolute ultimate bachelor's pad. Um, if you had a sort of casual, I don't know, 20 million or something like that, 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 that going spare. And... It, it was one of the last units that they hadn't sold. And at the same time, it just coincided that Rolls-Royce wanted to launch one of their new cars to their ultra high net worth clients. We, we approached them about the, or I approached them about this space and suggested that perhaps they could use the basement car park and then also have uh, these ultra high net worths introduced to the car and sold the dream from the, apartment and that that in itself would you know market the apartment and who knows maybe one of these these people would uh, buy the car and and the apartment it didn't quite work out like that but it went extremely well and they sold more of this particular rolls royce at this event in in pre-sales um because the car hadn't officially launched at that point um than i think ever before and it did get the apartment a great deal of interest so Long story short, <laughs> Rolls-Royce were extremely happy with what we'd offered. And we had a, a new office property on Grosvenor Street in Mayfair that was being launched to the market um, for, for, to rent. And uh, a big sort of office launch with uh, agents, or should I say brokers, now I'm in North America, coming to see the, see the property and then have a, a, a three-course lunch. And I, I picked up the phone and, and thought it would be really nice to have a Rolls Royce sat in front of the property as these uh, agents arrive and it would just set, set the tone. And they agreed and uh, a little bit of toing and froing, they, they said that I could pick it up. Um, my manager at the time said I absolutely could not pick up a Rolls Royce. We ended up compromising and someone else, a, a, a much more experienced driver and member of the team, picked up said Rolls-Royce and I held the, the, the relationship with Rolls-Royce and uh, I ended up having to look after the car whilst all of the uh, senior members of Grosvenor went in to wine and dine the brokers and I was very concerned obviously that, that we wouldn't want the car getting a parking ticket and I was in full possession of the key at the time and uh, 
I did uh, mention to my boss, you know, I might, might need to ever so slightly move the vehicle um, should a parking attendant come along. And uh, he went in, the door was closed and he embarked on his entertainment and he looked out the window and unfortunately as he looked out the window, the car was on the move and it was the first time I'd driven an automatic. It was by far the largest car I'd ever driven. <laughs> and I started sort of taking the car around uh, Mayfair. You know, the double glazed windows were down, the music was on. I picked up a friend and this is probably one of many career limiting moves I'll do, but I'm pretty sure I've got the record for uh, quickest speed up Grosvenor Street. But uh, anyway, I uh, live to tell another tale. And, uh, you know, sometimes you do uh, slightly dull things when you're a younger graduate. But uh, the car <laughs> was returned to Rolls Royce safely. So uh, I'd like that to be on the record too. <laughs> oh, good for you, Jack. That's a great story. All right. Well, I want to sort of come back to life in Vancouver then. Um, and yeah, with, with travel restrictions kind of easing up now, and I think we're, we're expecting an influx of, of, of new permanent residents and, and hopefully a lot of people choosing Vancouver and the real estate industry. You've got an interesting perspective transferring with, with your current employer to, to Vancouver. It's not, it's not that often that people get to do that. There aren't too many, I guess, global companies with big offices in, in Vancouver. So you're, you're pretty special, Jack, but I think we've, we've established that already. Um, <laughs> but like, how have you found settling into the city from a, from a work perspective, first of all, and perhaps like what advice do you have for others that are planning to follow suit? I would say that actually making the move personally from, from London to, to Vancouver, there's it, a few things you definitely have to get used to the advice that would be to really put yourself sort of out there and make as many connections as you can and just take the effort to get involved with with activities that interest you join clubs join the the industry networks the the udis and the ulis and later this year um, i'm sure richard will rope you into the um udi grouse grind event and and it, it does take time and um it does take effort in terms of the actual work change and whatnot, um, you know, real estate is real estate. It just takes, you do just have to get up to speed that the market works slightly differently here, that the market's obviously smaller for me coming from London, um, but it absolutely has that critical mass of, of real estate and activity. And I think it's a, a transition that if it's something you're sort of even slightly interested in, um, you should give it a go. And I'm fairly certain you won't regret moving to Vancouver. And and on the personal side, Jack, I've known you for a, for a couple of years now, and I feel like you've done more in terms of outdoor pursuits than, than most people have in a lifetime of living in, in BC. People will often say about Vancouver that you could be playing golf or laying on the beach in the morning and mountain biking or skiing in the afternoon. But give us a taste of some of the adventures and trips that you've taken that start from leaving your apartment downtown and yeah, ending up who knows where. I guess this segment could be called from, from the front door to the to the outdoors by Jack Haining. So what 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 have you been up to, Jack? Well I've learned learned all of my tricks from you, Richard. Um, and it is absolutely true that you you know you can leave your you know the comfort of your home or the comfort of a, a, a coffee shop. Um, in what feels like a metropolis and very, very quickly you're out on the side of a mountain um, doing one of, you know, a whole host of activities and, and it really is a, a, a big adults sort of playground um, with many, many opportunities to um, injure yourself and spend money on gear and, and whatnot. And, you know, since, since moving here, I've, you sort of alluded to it, but I'm not very good at saying no, which has really worked in my favour, but left my body uh, certainly feeling feeling the pain and had many cool trips. And uh, it, my life's been so different. You know, in London, I would go for the odd bike ride and run a little bit around Hyde Park. But a lot of my social activities were, you know, touring the pubs of 
of, of Soho and, and the West End and living really fairly uh, you know, unhealthily. But here, it, it's just so accessible, whether it be beaches or mountains or whatever it is, you can do stuff. So, you know, an early one um, back in 2019, uh, I think it was 2020, actually, you know, hopped in an Evo on a Friday with uh, with, with some some friends. And um, now, if you don't know what an Evo is, uh, it's a very, very small vehicle that's meant for sort of short trips around the city. We, we left rather late because one of them's a, a nuclear scientist, uh, Luca, and he he had a, an experiment that was uh, running over and we drove to Alberta uh, to do a bike ride. And uh, we got we got there in sort of the early hours, had very, very little sleep and uh, it was very poorly planned, but we cycled from Banff to Jasper over two days. And uh, somebody else then that we didn't really know picked our Evo up and, and, and met us um, in Jasper. And we then drove home five of us, four bikes and a hell of a lot of gear. Um, and, and that kind of set the theme really, you know, whether it be, embarking on big trail runs or having a crack at a few races or going mountain biking or skate skiing. Um, there's been lots of fun trips and re- most recently it's been the uh, backcountry skiing that I've been enjoying. Um, I've recently done my avalanche training, which was somewhat overdue and uh, tackled the, the, the Neve Traverse, which like many of my uh, trips ended up being a, a bit of a, a painful epic and I'm quite glad to be sat here in the warmth of a, an office today it was a sort of again not what, what is planned. the Neve Traverse Jack so it's a, a sort of 45 ish kilometer um ski tour from point to point um that ends it goes through Elfin Lakes and it goes up to uh, Lake Garibaldi and then you drop down to the car park and you know these things all look absolutely beautiful and you see pictures and you read reports and yeah, the, the reality of, you know, being on your feet, um, you know, in quite challenging terrain, perhaps a little inexperienced, uh, some would say, um, for 16 hours, you know, takes a toll. But you know, these are the stories you, you remember. And uh, yeah, it, it no, it's been a, a real joy moving here. And it's just opened up my life to all sorts of things. And I have a, a, a sort of three or four minute chat with my grandma each morning. We're, we're, we're quite close and, and you know, she's just telling me I'm going to absolutely wear my body out long before I'm old. Um, and that I, I she, she's always asking, well, what are you running from? And uh, <laughs> I don't really understand what she's talking about, but she continues to ask me that regularly. Yeah, may, maybe one day you will. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably in the next few years. <laughs> no, that's awesome, Jack. And I think a great promo for anyone thinking about moving out here. And um, yeah. And so no, amazing. Jack, I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much for your for your time sharing your your story, your journey, your experiences and your advice. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Richard. It's been brilliant speaking here today. And uh, yeah, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, pleasure. Okay, cheers. Bye. Thank you for listening to People Who Perform, the real estate careers podcast brought to you by Highview Partners, a talent search and recruitment firm focused exclusively on Canadian real estate. If your real estate team is looking to find the best next hire, or if you're ready to make the best next move in your career, then reach out to Highview Partners today. Follow us on LinkedIn, visit us at highviewpartners.ca.